Good morning, TEDx Santa Cruz. Thanks for having us. Over many years, I have been watching my husband in this amazing process of discovering the universe. And I've been thinking, well, what does this mean for the rest of us? We're not living in the universe we thought we were in. Well, it turns out that there is a profound connection between the enormous global problems, the seemingly intractable problems we're facing, and the fact that we have no accurate big picture. We don't know how we fit into the universe. We don't get what the cosmic discoveries that Joel and other scientists are making can mean for us in our lives on an emotional level, and we need to, because otherwise this disconnect is only going to grow more severe. The biggest problem facing us today in the world is not how to save the world. We actually know technologically much of what needs to be done, and a lot that could be done today. The biggest question facing us today is what can possibly motivate people to change enough, fast enough, to do enough? So this is our goal. By the end of this talk, we hope you'll see that you and all of us fit into the newly emerging scientific picture of the universe in an astonishing way. And that if we would start to think and act from this new perspective, we could solve the worst global problems. So how do we fit into the universe? Well, a common view is that we live on an average planet of an average star in a universe where no location is different from any other, like this drawing from Escher. Or that we are tossed into a cold and hostile universe, and it's a little chilling to think about it, so why bother? Look at these cartoons. What a clear night. Look at all the stars, millions of them, and Calvin says, yes, we're just tiny specks on a planet particle hurling through the infinite blackness. Let's go in and turn on all the lights. <laughs> and here's the identical idea in Peanuts. You're of no importance. Did you know that? You're only the tiniest speck in an enormous universe. Then I might as well go back to sleep. <laughs> but this picture of the universe is wrong. It's based on 17th century science. We are in a golden age of cosmology right now. After thousands of years of mythological origin stories and a few centuries of scientific sounding guesses, we have humanity's first picture of the universe as a whole ever based on evidence, ever. And it turns out that in the new picture, we are living on an extraordinary planet and our place in the universe is central. And I don't mean we are literally sitting in the middle of the universe because there is no middle to an expanding universe. What I mean is that we are central to the principles that underlie this new picture of the universe. And that can begin to give us the context in which we can understand what is it possible to do to alter the dangerous trends on Earth. But what's more is this gives us the seed of a big new identity that can actually motivate us to make those changes. So, let me tell you some of the ways that we're central or special in this new picture of the universe. Our bodies are at the midpoint of all possible sizes. We're made of the rarest material in the universe. And we live in the middle of time four different ways. Let's start with the first one, the midpoint of all possible sizes. This symbol represents the modern picture of the universe from the point of view of size. It turns out that there's a smallest and a largest size, and we've arrayed all these sizes around the serpent, starting with the smallest size, allowed by physics, the Planck length at the tip of the tail, and then all the way around to the size of the entire visible universe at the head. You'll notice that there's this blue section. That's the range of sizes that people have always known about, from the smallest thing we can see with the unaided eye, a gnat or something like that, up to something like the sun. We humans are indeed on the small end of that scale. But science has now discovered the full range of possible sizes in the universe. And among all those sizes, you can see that our position is central. And we couldn't be anywhere else. If we were 
much smaller, we wouldn't be made of enough atoms to have our complex consciousness. If we were much bigger, the speed of light would inhibit communications. It's the central size that can produce a brain that can conceive of a universe. And that's why, if there are intelligent aliens out there, they're likely to be about our size. Now, let's look at all the sizes we can picture. From the distribution of galaxies on a really large scale, to the size of an individual galaxy like our own, to the size of our planetary system, much smaller than a galaxy, and now zeroing in on Earth. The human scale is much smaller than that. In fact, we'll look at some kids. And these kids are looking at a drop of water that has a single-celled creature in it. Now we're in the nucleus of that cell, looking at the DNA molecules, now a single atom. Now, much smaller, the nucleus of that atom, and some quarks floating around. The next way that we're central is that we are made of the rarest material in the universe. So this symbol represents all the visible matter in the universe. Of course, we borrowed it from the back of the dollar bill, but the uh, proportions are accurate. The huge base at the bottom represents hydrogen and helium, which is what the stars are made of. They came, hydrogen and helium came right out of the Big Bang. At the depths of stars, all the other atoms, the entire periodic table of the elements, gets blown out of those stars as stardust. Stardust is represented by the floating capstone at the top of the pyramid. The eye represents the stardust in intelligent beings because intelligent beings can only be made of stardust. The eye is us. Now, this visible matter is what people used to think was all that existed. But now we know that all the visible things in the universe, the stars, the planets, the gas, the dust, all the distant galaxies together total less than half of 1% of what's actually out there. The pyramid of all visible matter is resting on the ground. Let's look what's underneath. You can see that the visible stuff, that half a percent, is just the tip of this enormous cosmic density pyramid. We now have, for the first time, a theory of the universe based on evidence. And according to that theory, almost everything in the universe is made of two invisible things, dark matter and dark energy. There's a lot of invisible atoms, too, but they're just a small part of the total mass. It's mostly cold, dark matter. We don't know what cold, dark matter is yet, but we know it's not made of atoms or any of the parts of atoms. We're trying very hard to figure out what it is with laboratory experiments, and we're even trying to produce it. The dark energy is what powers the increasing expansion of the universe. There's much that still remains to be understood about both dark matter and dark energy, but we can put them in the computer according to the rules of our modern theory and figure out what it's going to look like. And this is what the dark matter would look like if you could see it. We're using brightness to represent the density of dark matter. You can see that the dark matter in this region about 100 million light years across is spread out in these long filaments with the little blobs representing where individual galaxies like the Milky Way would form. Where the filaments cross, you get these gigantic blobs of dark matter and they will host clusters of hundreds or thousands of galaxies. The whole thing expands as space expands. Now we can compare the distribution of galaxies predicted by this sort of simulation with the actual distribution of galaxies in the universe. And the agreement is spectacularly good, which gives great joy to theorists like me. As Nancy explained, we're made of stardust. But stardust wouldn't exist without dark matter. The gravity of the dark matter pulls ordinary matter into the centers of the forming galaxies. And there, the ordinary matter forms stars, and stardust, and planets, and ultimately us. The gravity of the dark matter cradles the galaxies, protecting them against the dark energy that's tearing space apart outside. So dark matter is our friend. <laughs> And 
finally, we're living in the, mid, in the middle of time in four different ways. This is so important. Our technologies have gotten way ahead of our ability to control or really even understand their effects, largely because we don't know how to look far enough ahead. And this is why our society has not really grasped the seriousness of disrupting the global climate or causing mass extinctions. What we need to understand is how our special moment fits into the larger scales of cosmic time. Let me explain how we fit into the center of time on the scale of the cosmos, the solar system, our planet, and life. From the point of view of the cosmos, it took billions of years to create a planet like Earth, and then billions of years of biological evolution before a species came along with the scientific and technological ability to see the most distant galaxies. Now, space is expanding faster and faster, and the most distant galaxies are disappearing because the amount of space between us and them is increasing so rapidly. There will never again be so many galaxies. This is the best time for astronomical observation, we tell the funding agencies. <laughs> now I'm going to use some graphs, because I like graphs. Uh, this is a graph that shows the age of the solar system on the horizontal axis in billions of years and the heat of the sun. And you can see from the path of the sun that the sun has been getting steadily warmer. Now, we live in the middle of the solar system's existence. It started four and a half billion years ago. In about six billion years, the sun will swell up into a red giant and swallow the inner planets. We live in the middle of the best period for life on Earth. That began about half a billion years ago when, thanks to microorganisms, the Earth acquired the oxygen-rich atmosphere that we all breathe today. That's when the large creatures started to evolve. It'll end in about half a billion years when the increasing heat of the sun evaporates all the water which will ultimately be lost. But we live in the middle of the best period. There's at least hundreds of millions of years to go of good times, plenty of time for our, <laughs> for our descendants to colonize other planetary systems across the galaxy, for example. We have much more pressing problems to deal with. This graph shows that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that's this blue curve, has been essentially constant for the last 2,000 years. And in fact, it hasn't gone above 300 parts per million for at least the last 800,000 years. But in the Industrial Revolution, our ancestors started to burn fossil fuels. And the amount has been doubling about every 30 years since 1800. And the human contribution of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere is now shooting up almost vertically. For the last thousands of years, we humans had almost no impact on a global scale. But as you can see, we're now starting to have an enormous impact. And if we continue at the present rate, the amount will increase by a factor of eight in this century. The consequences for climate would be catastrophic. For this and many other reasons, we're going to have to stop these exponential increases in our impact on the environment very quickly. The reason that the societies around the world seem unable to deal with these long-term problems may be that they can't grasp the immense length of time that our present actions will affect. Imagine <clears throat> for a moment that you have lost your memory. You're looking in a mirror like this girl, and you see your body, you see your reflection, your body is solid, your heart is pounding, but you have no sense of any time. You have no idea how you got to the spot on which you stand. Who are you? You're not your family background or your personal history or the work you've done. These things don't exist. You're like a computer with hormones. <laughs> You're listening to the latest music. You're buying the latest improved products. You're believing the latest media interpretation of the world outside your room. This is all you know. Now, imagine instead that you look into the mirror, but this time you can see past 
the momentary you of today, back to the you of years ago, the child you once were, the toddler. Send your consciousness backward through time at lightning speed past your parents, past your grandparents, down past all the generations before them, your ancestors roaming from continent to continent, your primate ancestors, back past all the animals before them, down to the earliest life, into the first cell, then down into that cell to the complex chemicals that made it possible, and down into the molten earth and the forming solar system, back to the birth of your carbon and oxygen and iron atoms in exploding stars far across the galaxy back to the formation of the galaxy itself, deep inside a huge halo of dark matter, and back, back through the universal expansion to the creation of your elementary particles that you are made of at this very moment in the Big Bang. This is not fantasy, this is science. We are all this. What we are is the sum total of our history and how far back we understand that history, how much of our identity we claim is up to us. No one had this choice before. Our generation is the first because we are the first to know our real origin story. Cosmology has given us a new but multi-billion year old identity. This discovery of who we actually are is something that no one could know or even imagine without science. Cosmology also has given us powerful new concepts that let us understand for the first time the true scale of our universe and of our problems. There's a symmetry between our conception of past and future. People who imagine that the universe is only a few thousand years old can probably not imagine a future much longer than that. The key to visualizing a long-term future for humanity may be to grasp our immense cosmic past. That may be the greatest gift of cosmology to the world. People don't change from learning facts. People change from discovering a big new identity that is available to them, that is meaningful and exciting, and that connects them to people that they want to be part of. Under these circumstances, people can actually change very quickly to become the larger person they suddenly realize they can be. This is how we fall in love. This is how addicts recover. This is how people have spiritual awakenings. This is an ability everybody has. Our species is central to the cosmos and central to the future of Earth. And those of us who are alive today at this pivotal moment may be the most significant generations ever. If we could simply live up to this identity, that would transform the world. Thank you. <laughs>